But uh, anyhow, we have a um, very, uh, I think anyway, it's a very interesting study today. It is continuation of God's omnipresence. But we're going to try and understand how God's ability to be omnipresent manages prophecy. Very important. All believers believe in prophecy, am I right? All Christian believers, all Jewish believers, we believe in prophecy in that we know that God prophesied through prophets, obviously, and those prophecies come true. What happens when the prophecy doesn't come true? We have a problem with the prophet. And how many times can a prophet make wrong prophecies? How many times? Once? The Bible tells us we have to forgive how many times? 70 times 7, right? What about prophets? Forgive 70 times 7? Maybe 3 times it could be wrong? We're going to see today how it is That the godliness of God enables prophecy. But we want to see it very specifically in the life of the Apostle Paul. Is this thing still on? Okay. Um, to start with, we want to do a bit of a review on what we have been discussing with regards to omnipresence. And uh, what we studied the last couple of weeks. Then I want to give a little bit of an introduction to Paul, the Apostle Paul. I think we all know the Apostle Paul. But I want to talk a little bit about him. Then we'll go ahead and start the sermon. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on how God is not limited to time. We talked about space. God is not limited to space. He's beyond space. He's beyond Whatever there is, he's not within the created realm. He's outside of the created realm. We talk about dimensions. That there is a single dimension, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional world. We are aware of and live in a three-dimensional world. But scientists know that there are up to 11 dimensions. There are some scientists who have identified 14 dimensions. They don't understand them, and they cannot explain them, but they know that they're there. And somewhere in the 4th through 14th dimension, there's these spiritual things that we don't yet quite understand. That are controlled and within the realm of God's knowledge, not ours. We also studied a little bit about uh, quantum physics. How God is involved in the minutest, the minutest of known particles. Particles are those various uh, uh, protons, neutrons that, that, uh, that end up creating atoms and photons when photons provide light and energy. We studied that last couple of weeks. Now, it is the movement of the particles within the atoms that energizes and creates what we know that develops and maintains and sustains life. It's that energy. By the way, last week, uh, I, I forgot to study. I meant to study it. I'm going to study now. Maybe next week I'll remember. That some research has indicated that atoms stop moving when they realize that they're being watched. Never heard anything like that before. But I just read last week. That scientists had discovered this. So I'm going to study that a bit more and come back and tell you about it. Because that's kind of interesting. I don't know how that works. But it'll be kind of fun. Now, in studying time and God's omnipresence, we know about God's presence in space. We studied about God's presence in time. So God can exist in time that is past. And God can exist in time that is the future. Why? Because God can travel much faster, not only travel, God can be present 
in all time. We studied last week that uh, the sun is, what, 93 million miles away? And it takes light how long to travel from the, earth, uh, from the sun to the earth? Eight. Eight minutes. And 150 billion years, 150 billion years for light to travel the length and width of the known universe. Now, is there anything outside the universe? No. Why? Because if there is something outside the universe, it's part of the universe. So there is nothing outside the universe. God is everywhere. And God knows from the past to the future. Today, the reason I want to study this today is very simple. Because God's omnipresence really is only a word unless we understand what it is. And if we understand what it is, it really has no bearing on us unless we understand what effects God's omnipresence has on us. To study that, I'd like to invite you to go to Acts chapter 21. It's a book. It's a record that is written by Luke. Luke who accompanied Paul on some of his travels and made a very good record of the early church. Luke was the only one of the disciples or the, uh, the, the, the people who would follow Jesus Christ who was not a Jew, he was a Greek. So it came from a different perspective. The first gospel was written by who? Mark. Mark. Very concise, very fast-paced. Second one was written by Matthew. Matthew basically covers the entire information that's needed. It's very long and it's very deep. If you only had one gospel, Matthew would be it. After that was written, Luke. Luke comes from a little medical background. He talks more about miracles than others do. And the last one is John. It was the last one to be written. And John talks more about the deity of Jesus Christ. That was the last one to be written. So Luke, who wrote the third gospel, is now also makes a record of the early church and specific travels of Paul. Now, here, we're going to go back and forth a little bit because Paul has already embarked on a trip. He's traveling to Jerusalem. And we're going to see what happens when he makes plans to go to Jerusalem and that he's giving, given a warning not to go. So shall we start reading chapter 1 of the book of Acts? Everybody remember who Paul was? Who was Paul? Paul, where was he born? Tarsus. He was from a very, very wealthy family who were tent makers for the Roman army. Remember that? He was educated till the age of 12 in Tarsus, a great university city, great industrial city. And then at the age of 12, he was moved to Jerusalem by his parents to study in the school of Hillel, the best school under the best teacher, Gamaliel. At a very young age, he became a leader and part of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was a ruling party of the Jews with 70 people, 40 Sadducees and 30 Pharisees. Of the 30 Pharisees, he was one of them and a leader. And he was such a great leader and such a well-read and well-informed and well-educated leader that he was the one who was given the responsibility to protect the Jewish faith when the Christians began to be con converting Jews. He was given the job to stop that from happening. He was a very influential man. He's spiritually a great leader. He was a powerful man, rich man. He was not only a Jew, not only a Pharisee, but also a Roman citizen. So now we know who, who, who we're talking about. Paul established several churches that he had actually planted. Now Paul has been uh, away from his churches and he was in Ephesus and he begins to travel now 
And he wants to go back to Jerusalem. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was going to read it afterward, but I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 20 and verse 22 on first, and then we will go into chapter 21. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task to testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will never see me again. Okay? The Apostle Paul is telling the people that, listen, I am leaving and you are never going to see me again. Every city I go to, I have been warned, don't go there and preach because I'm under threat. But this time where I am going, there is a greater threat. And where is it that he's going? And now I'm compelled, I am going to Jerusalem. I'm going to Jerusalem. And why is he going to Jerusalem? Go to Romans chapter 9. We're going we're gonna to come back to Acts 21. Or we're going to go ahead and set the stage here a little bit. We go to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to read from the first verse. Romans 9, 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it. Through the Holy Spirit, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. What does it say? What's he saying here? He's saying that I tell you the truth. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it. I it, it confirms it through the Holy Spirit. Now, take notice. Paul, before he makes a statement, before he explains what he's going to tell them, he makes sure that the people listening to him understand that what he's about to tell them is very, very serious. And he's very honest about it. And he tells them how many times? He says... I speak the truth, number one. I'm not lying. He confirms it twice. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. So three times he confirms with them, he attests to them that what I'm about to tell you is from the deepest sense of my heart. You remember in Judaism, we've studied this before, that the maximum, the extent of anything that you could express was how many times? Here's a hint. We said in Isaiah, the angel said what? God is holy, holy, holy. And we said in other sermons and other studies, we've studied what? The Jews could forgive how many times? Here's, here's a hint. Anybody got it? How many times you could forgive? You could forgive three times. That's why when Peter asked the question to Jesus... How many times should I forgive? Seven times? In other words, I double the three plus add one. So I forgive seven times. He thought he was doing something really great. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. So the number three is very important in Judaism. Therefore, when Paul says three times, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people and my own race. What is he saying? That I would wish that even if I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I myself 
would give up salvation for the sake of my people. I wish that I could bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to my people. How much did this man love the gospel of Jesus Christ? This man, outside of Jesus Christ, I believe there are two people who influenced the world greatly. One was Martin Luther. Because if it wasn't for Martin Luther, and if it wasn't for the Reformation, we would not have North America and South America settled the way it was. We wouldn't have the world the way it was today. We wouldn't have education the way it was today. We wouldn't have democracy the way it is today. We wouldn't have capitalism as we have it today. We wouldn't have universities as we have it today if it wasn't for Martin Luther. Because when Martin Luther started the Reformation, the Catholic Church started the Counter-Reformation, and they began to send people around the world to resettle the Catholic Church, to get more people into the Catholic Church as they were losing the people from the Church. So Martin Luther influenced the world in a great way. The only person who influenced the world more than Martin Luther outside of Jesus was Paul. Why? Because it was the writings of Paul that converted Martin Luther to begin with. Martin Luther was changed as a result of Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. It transformed him. And it was the apostle Paul who took Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four gospels, basically create the history that record what happened in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But to take that information, to take the history of the life of Jesus Christ and make a theology of the gospel, the good news out of it, was the Apostle Paul. It is he who talks about righteousness by faith. It is he who talks about Jesus being the second Adam. It is he who explains that sin came through Adam, but righteousness through Christ Jesus. Without the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't have the Christian church as we know it today. And this man says that I would rather give up my relationship with Christ if I could bring the gospel to my brothers and sisters. So he plans his trip to Jerusalem. And he plans it in such a way that he could be there for the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost was this. Every year people used to come for several days and they would gather in Jerusalem. From all over the world the Jews would come. And do you remember when the church started what was happening in Jerusalem when Peter preached the sermon? And the Holy Spirit first came. It was the day of Pentecost. Now again, it is Pentecost. And Paul wants to be in Jerusalem because he knows there are going to be tens of thousands of people there. Millions, we are told. And he wants to be there to preach, take this opportunity to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ to his people, whom he has ignored because he has just gone and spoken to Gentiles all over the world. So he's now coming back to Jerusalem in order to preach to the Jews. Chapter 21. After we had torn ourselves away from them. I'm going to go back to verse 36 of chapter 20 to give us more context. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. This is now Paul leaving to go on his next trip. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. What a sad, sad scene this is. And how much affection the people have for the Apostle Paul. After we had torn ourselves away from these people, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, 
We sailed on to Syria. I think some of your Bibles will say to the left of us. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left them and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us to the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. What happened here? They went there and met these people. And did they know about Paul's speech before he left? Did they know what Paul's plan was to go to Jerusalem and preach to the Jews? They didn't know because there were some new people, some new believers that they met here. And when they met the people, the people came to Paul. And they said, we have been shown by the Spirit of God that you should not go where? To Jerusalem. Do not go to Jerusalem. But what did they do? They said goodbye to all the people and all the people that were traveling with Paul. And Paul got on the ship to go where? Toward Jerusalem. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we were greeted by the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, and he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. You remember Philip the Evangelist? Caesarea is the city. We, we speak of it in another chapter. In, in Matthew, we have the story, Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus uh, talks to Peter. And uh, he says, uh, the, who am I? They say, some say you are this and some say you are that. So who do you say that I am? This is Caesarea. So now they're back in Caesarea. Paul is back in Caesarea. And here is where Philip the evangelist lives. And they are at the home of Philip. And verse 10, after, had been, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. What happens? Agabus, who was a prophet, he comes to the home of the evangelist. And he goes to Paul. And he takes from him, it's not really, we call a belt, this is a belt. But what they used to have was basically a, um, a, a, a sash, a, 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 a cummerbund almost, uh, where it was a long piece of cloth, uh, where they would tie it around their waist, and it would hang on the one side so it didn't interfere with their walking. And if they needed to cover themselves in the cold, they could take it out and wrap it around themselves. It was long, almost a blanket kind of a thing. So he takes that. And the prophet ties his hand with it. And he ties his feet with it. And he says, now, I've been shown by God that the owner of this is going to be tied up like this. And handed over to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The Romans. Could be handed over to the Romans. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt and he tied it. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. We and the people pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? These people are crying because Paul is an important person. And then Paul, you're going to be taken prisoner. God is telling us. He sent his prophet. He said, Why are you crying? I am ready not only to be bound. In other words, I don't mind being a prisoner but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. 
when he would not be dissuaded, in other words, when Paul did, would not change his mind, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Nason, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. Now, pay attention. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see who? James. Who? James. Who was James? Who was James? He was the brother of Jesus. Yeah. He was also the leader of the church. So all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul told, Paul told all these leaders what he had done in his ministry. He was trying to explain to them how God had used him. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, now, Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? And all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. Now, are you paying attention? The elders of the church, the leaders of the church, and the leader, the pastor of the church, James, they all get together and say, Paul, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Now you see, you've been out there telling the Gentiles, you don't have to follow the laws of Moses, and you don't have to circumcise. Now all these people that are here in Jerusalem, they all know what you've been doing. Why? Because Paul was a well-known leader. A leader of the church leaves the church, and it tells the people, don't follow the church. Why? Because the church is wrong. The Jews are wrong, so he leaves. Now he comes back to Jerusalem, and the elders and the pastor get together and tell him, listen, you know all these Jews? They're not going to listen to you. You have lost all credibility with these people. You need to do something, and we have an idea. And here's the idea. Here's what they tell him. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rite, and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Now, this, they used to take a purification vow, a Nazarite vow, where for certain days they, wouldn't, they, they would fast, they would pray, they would cleanse themselves, and then they would shave their head, and then they would take sacrifice for their sin, and they would go to the temple and offer the sacrifice. Now, they're saying that there are four people among us who have taken this very difficult vow. Now, you pay for their cost of their purification, shave their head, shave your head, and go with them, then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you but, that you. but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentiles, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from sacrifice to idols and so on. Now, what is he saying? The leader is saying, don't worry about the Gentiles. We've already written to them that whatever you've taught them is good. So the Gentiles don't have to know about this. All right? We've gone ahead and told them, you do what you have to do. But you, Paul, you go with these four men, go to the temple and make a sacrifice. Make a sacrifice. Then all the Jews will believe that you are a person who keeps the law. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. 
Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So they had to go and make an appointment with the priests that our days of purification, our seven days are going to be over and we're going to come and we're going to bring a sacrifice with us. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. What had happened was, Paul had one of the Greek converts with him. Trophimus was with him in the city. So now some of the, 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 the zealots... We call them Judaizers. These are the same people that were going to Galatia and Ephesus afterward and telling people that you still need to be like the Jews. You remember that? Same people. Now they're in Jerusalem and they say, This Paul, help us arrest him. Why? Because he breaks the law and he teaches people to go against God. The whole city was aroused. Just some people? The whole city was aroused and people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowds. Now what happens is, the Jews, they don't want to arrest him. They don't want to have a trial. They want to kill him. They want to kill him. Now, the Romans had built a great tower close to the temple. And up there they used to keep a watch. Especially on the high holidays. Pentecost. And they would have had people over there. Over during the Passover as well. And the soldiers, by the time they found out there was a commotion there, they came running and they got Paul. And if we keep on reading, we're told that, they, that the Jews wanted to kill Paul so badly that the soldiers had to carry Paul to safety. They had to carry him to safety. Now, as we go on, the Jews try many, many different ways to kill him. They, 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 they have several plots with the Romans, that if you send him from this place to this place, then they plan to kill him on the way. They've, they've done this a couple of times, they're, they're going to do this. But the Romans find out that Paul is also a Roman citizen. And therefore, they have no choice but to give him his wishes to talk to the king. And the Jews cannot kill him because he's a Roman citizen. Now, interesting. What is the message of Paul in the Bible? Is it an important message? Is it? Let me ask it a different way. In the Christian faith, what is the cornerstone of the faith? What is the cornerstone of the faith? How are we saved? Salvation through faith. Salvation through faith. Righteousness by faith. And who introduced? And who teaches? And who preaches? And who explains the doctrine of righteousness by faith? Who is it? Paul. I ask you. Why was God stopping Paul from going to Jerusalem? Was God angry? Was God not happy that Paul was going to preach to the Jews? Did God not want Paul to preach to the Jews? Was God anti-Jew? No. Because God knew something was going to happen. God could see in time. Because God lives in the past. He lives in the current. And He lives in the future 
God could see that something was going to happen to Paul. God could see that the leaders of the church were going to be misled. And they were going to make a recommendation to Paul. And if Paul follows through with the recommendation of the head office in Jerusalem, what would have happened? Paul would have made a sacrifice in the temple. And what did the sacrifice in the temple mean? What did it mean? In Corinthians, Paul had said what? Now, who is our sacrifice? Jesus is our sacrifice once and for ever. Now, that same Paul, after establishing the churches and saying that we do not need the sacrifice anymore. That same Paul who is preaching that we have to give up the daily sacrifice. We have to give, give up the ceremonial sacrifices. We live not through our sacrifices, but we live through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ alone. We live only by faith. This same Paul was about to go to the temple. He went to the temple to make a sacrifice. And if he had made that sacrifice, what would happen to the message of Romans? Have no meaning. What would happen to the message of Ephesians, Galatians, Philemon? What would happen? There would be no preaching because Paul would have lost all credibility. All credibility. So God stopped him. God stopped him from making that great mistake. From making a horrible mistake. And then Paul ended up being in prison from this action that God told him not to do. Time and time again, God said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. He sent a prophet. But Paul followed his own personal desire. And because of it, Paul's ministry came to an end. Within a couple of years, Paul was killed. He was moved from Jerusalem Eventually to Rome, where the Romans kept him under house arrest. And under house arrest, he was allowed from about A.D. 60 to 62. He was allowed to have visitors. And it was there when he was under guard, a prisoner of Rome, where he wrote the books of Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. And he wrote to the people. Reminding them because he himself almost made that mistake. That terrible mistake. To diminish who Jesus Christ was. And how important his life, death and resurrection was. Now, what does that have to do with you and I? In our lives. In our lives. We make plans like the Apostle Paul did. And we get suggestions from people around us. But when we ask God to take our will and make it His will, God has ways that He can direct us as long as we have asked Him to. As long as we have asked Him to. When even for one part of that, the great apostle Paul made a mistake and put his will over God's. His ministry came to an end. What more the apostle Paul could have done if he had stayed away from Jerusalem? How many more churches he may have planted? We don't know. But this we know. The God that we worship. He knows every intricate part of our being. 
every cell in our body, every atom in our body, every, every particle in our body is known to God and it is sustained by God. The photons that provide the light and the electricity to the particle so they may sustain themselves comes only from God. Only from God. It is that's why he says that he knows every hair on our head. He knows us intimately. He knows where you've been. He, he tells that David says what? Before I was born, when I was in my mother's womb, you knew about me. Jeremiah tells us, Jeremiah 23 tells us, God pronounced Jeremiah a prophet before he was born. God's omnipresence tells us that God lives in the present. He lives in the past. He lives in the future. He knows where we are going to be in five years, in ten years, in twenty years. But he doesn't force us. He doesn't force us to follow him. He doesn't. He allows us to make our decisions. And sometimes, even when we make bad decisions, he uses our mistakes as long as we are still committed to him. Paul didn't give up on God, even though he made a mistake. Therefore, God was able to use him and arrange for him a house arrest where he could write, where he could write those letters which guide us today in our understanding of Jesus Christ and his righteousness and how we are saved. And the omnipresence of God. The godliness of God is absolutely imperative in our existence, in our sustenance, in our survival, and in our future. That same James, that same James that we See, here in the book of Acts, telling Paul to go and make the mistake that he did. He has something to say about making plans for our future. Because he saw the Apostle Paul making plans for the future, didn't he? And what happened to the plans of the Apostle Paul? This is what the letter, uh, the, the book of James says. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why? Do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it is God's will, we can do this or that. Because it is God who knows the end from the beginning. He knows. He doesn't force us. He doesn't force himself. He doesn't intervene where he doesn't need to be required, where it's not required. But do take note that when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, God intervenes over and over and over again. It is for the sake of the preaching of the gospel that we see all the miracles taking place in the Bible. The miracles were there, not for the benefit of those who received the miracles, but it was for the benefit of those who are watching and learning so they could have faith in the words of Jesus and the apostles. Yes, God does intervene, but he doesn't intervene only for our temporal benefit. He intervenes that people may have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And like Paul, 
We should have desires more than anything to go and tell our people, our husbands and wives and our friends and our cousins and our relatives and our children and people that we work with, we should tell them. People that we supposedly love, we should tell them about Jesus and have this desire like Paul did, that even if I die, I have to go. But that kind of desire to share the love of God only comes if we have a testimony of our relationship with God in our own lives. If I don't have that relationship with God, there is no way that I have a story to tell. I don't have a story to tell. Who am I going to tell? What am I going to tell? And when it comes down to it, it is not the wisdom of the elders. It is not the wisdom of the organized church. It is only the word of God that makes a difference. It is this, the word of God, that we follow in all of our plans, in all of our objectives, and in our relationship with God. As we as a congregation and individuals strive to please God, let us make sure that our lives are in line with what God tells us in His Word. God bless you. Amen.